All right, so this officially begins our final PDH presentation, keeping your HVAC water clean with David Romeo with Miller Lehman. David, how are you today? Good, Tony. I'm very well. Thank you for inviting us. Awesome. Excellent. Well, we appreciate you being here. We again thank everybody for uh, watching us all day, and uh, we're looking forward to finishing it up with the best. Did we save the best for last? And every everybody was really good. So. <laughs> <laughs> of course we did. But uh, no, nah, David and I have done a lot together, and um, David has some videos in his presentation. Now I'll tell you, sometimes we stream the videos and they come through clear. Sometimes they're choppy. Either way, I think we'll get the gist of. Uh, what he's trying to show us, it, I, I think they do, a, the videos help so much with understanding the different technologies and like how they work and how the water flows and grabs the stuff out of it we don't want in the water. So, um, okay, David, well, right. take it away, buddy. Thank you. And like you have there, keeping your HVAC water clean. And that's our focus today uh, with this presentation. And as you all know, keeping your chillers and heat exchangers, cooling towers and cooling tower fill clean is going to be very cost effective for the customer, reducing the, the cost of, of getting that chilled water across those heat exchangers, chillers, making everything much more efficient. And that's what we want to focus on. And all of our products, every time we look at a product and we want to develop a product, um, I think and everybody should be looking at this is keeping them as efficient as possible, looking at pressure drops, looking at um, uh, you know, the clean pressure drop, dirty pressure drop, the amount of water it's going to use to back flush and, you know, moving parts, et cetera, the least amount of moving parts. So we try to keep that in mind in all of our products and all other products that are out there in the filtration world. Um, go for Yeah, here. we've had a kind of a running theme today of, you know, it depends, right? What's the best right. way to filter my water? It depends, you know, it's all, and it always ends up with the engineering trade-offs of, you know, the efficiency of it, the cost of it, the space it takes up, the maintenance. So, you know, there's no magic bullet water filter or chiller or any any type of product for every application. It really just, it, it, we're big on the, it depends. And uh, I know David's that way too, so. Yeah, definitely. And, and those were very good points, the space it takes of, that, you know, that's so important these days. And also the weight of the unit itself you have to look at. So there's a lot of little, little variables in there that sometimes I don't even look at. So that was a good mm -hmm. point. Okay. Good. Go on to the next screen is that there we go okay these are just a few companies that we've worked with in the past um quite a bit matter of fact um so you might want to take a gander there maybe some of you are from those companies and if you are you can let me know and i can tell you what projects we worked on with you but that's a few companies that we worked on in, in um over the years who are we um Miller Lehman started out in 1991. We have a 52,000 square feet building here in Daytona Beach, Florida. That's a good picture of the building um, right there. Um, let me just see here. Try now, where's the beach from there, David? Right behind it? Uh, the beach at this point, <laughs> bird flies, it's around a mile. Just uh, We are just uh, inland uh, from the intercoastal waterway and of course the peninsula of where the beach is at. So um, we're around a mile from there, uh, right off of Orange Avenue, which if anybody's been to Daytona Beach, runs parallel with International Speedway Boulevard. So we're right in that area. Um, nice. Yeah. That's the building. Uh, we, you know, 52,000 square foot, our manufacturing part of that is around 30,000 at this time. So we have room for expansion. Our products and, um, you know, we can look at screen filters, which is our Thompson strainer. We have RO systems. We have the automatic turbo disc system, the uh, UF ultra filtration membrane system, sand filters. And then we have some point of use little helix filters um, that we sell for point of use applications, kind of where they're manual, like a Y strainer, any of those um, that can be used as a, as a filter. We sell them to you know, anywhere from a two inch line all the way up to a three inch line. And uh, that's our line. We look at our line closely every year. We try to make it more efficient. Uh, we don't handle any other um, types of filtrations. We, there are also bag filters out there that are used in competition with a lot of our, our screen filters. 
Um, there's also centrifugal separators out there that are um, kind of inefficient because of the high pressure drop that you have to have going across a centrifugal separator. Also, we don't believe in non-barrier filtration. So if you think of a centrifugal separator, it's spinning the water to keep the particulate slung to the outside. It filters down to a specific gravity of 2.2 or larger. So it's taking out the sand and dirt. And when you're talking about cooling towers, that's probably only around 10% of the particulate in a cooling tower. So we don't believe in a non-barrier filter, so we do not have a sand, centrifugal separator line. Uh, sand filters, um, they've been around for years. They work extremely well. Um, there's negatives, the amount of water it uses, um, and also the weight of it. Um, so it's not one of our um, you know, go-to filters because a lot of people come, come to us with um, our efficiency um, and looking at the turbidus or the Thompson strainers or some of the RO filters. So the different technologies mm -hmm. we're going to talk about today are strainers in general. We're going to talk about the turbo disc or the membrane. What's the generic? Is there a generic term for that type well, of filter, there's, David? <clears throat> there's RO membrane, reverse osmosis, and then mm -hmm. there's UF mem membrane, which is ultrafiltration membrane, um, which falls also in the category of nanofiltration and microfiltration. So, Got it. Okay. Um, but RO is kind of, you know, we're... Mm -hmm. You want to be to remove your viruses and bacteria and making potable water. Um, our UF micro nano are kind of pre filtrations to RO as well. Gotcha. So I jumped a, I jumped ahead of the gun a little bit. We're going to talk about that, I'm sure, in a few more slides. But the uh, so for general uh, knowledge for you know, and a lot of people watching this, you know, might be just starting out in the industry or might be just a few years into it. So strainer products in general. Um, Go ahead and tell us when you would use those and what the pros and cons are, et cetera. Sure. Um, our Thompson strainer series, um, you know, is quite unique. But first of all, there's no moving parts. So we have a lot of OEMs that love that and want to buy them because there's no moving parts, which is a lot less headaches um, for the customer. Um, they're all stainless steel. Um, they also have an air relief at the top. Um, space saving design, no matter if it's a two inch or a 14 inch. Uh, less than one PSI pressure drop um, when clean. So we put a lot of surface area into our strainers um, and low maintenance. Now, if you take a look at like the series, um, Tony was saying, um, this is the series that we offer, the two inch all the way through the 14 inch. So where do we use them? Um, you know, if you have a low tonnage cooling tower, say 300 tons and 200 tons, you're just flowing roughly 800 to 900 gallons per minute. It's a great application to put 100% filtration in that system. When you get to larger cooling towers or larger tons, 3,000 tons where you're running 9,000 gallons per minute, you may want to look at a side stream application for that out of the equalizer piping or the sump and then filtering it back. But also the, tur the Thompson strainers are used in applications to protect heat exchangers, chillers. Um, if any of you carry multi-stack or climate cool chiller applications, we have sold hundreds, if not thousands of applications in front of chiller systems like multi-stack or climate cool. Most of their piping on those chiller applications are six inch. So we would focus on the, the six inch strainer itself. Um, which is um, located, as you can see, for around 750 GPM, 745 square inches of surface area. So that's a major component. We're also seeing a lot of sales and off of um, our HVAC reps and uh, other reps of seeing it returning back to the cooling tower. A lot of applications where the nozzles on top of the cooling tower can become clogged. Uh, with particulate that is in the process that gets back to the cooling tower, fills up the fill. And ultimately, uh, we mm -hmm. had one recently at Nucor Steel where, you know, it collapsed the fill. But putting a strainer on the unit next to them, they compared the two. It worked extremely well to prevent any particulate, in this case, slag and some other issues coming back to the cooling tower, um, preventing those nozzles to work properly to dissipate the, the water over the fill and let the fill handle it to chill it. Um, so, so you would see this on the condenser loop of the chiller going definitely. back to the cooling tower? Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. What about on the chill water loop, side? Open loop. Okay. Uh, yeah. In those applications as well. Um, now you got to remember it is a screen filter. Screen filters of any type are going to have their limitations because there's just surface area filtration. It's just a screen, just like a piece mm -hmm. of paper. 
And um, you're going to order it with either a mesh or micron, whatever the conversion may be. But those are absolute. It's not like a bag filter where typically they're nominal. These are absolute filtration levels. And then um, as it cakes up, we offer a few packages, which is called a pressure differential arm and automatic timer flush, which is then going to flush the unit. But just to keep in mind, screen filters have their limitations. They do great with non-organic applications, sand, dirt, scale, you know, stuff like that. When mm -hmm. you get a lot of organic growth, you need to go to a more of a three-dimensional filter, which is like our turbo disc sand filters or, or membranes of some sort. Gotcha. Um, when you're worried about organic, so yes, it makes um, sense. So this is a then, big, it's a big grabber, the strainer, it's right. Yes, so, it yeah. is. It has that low pressure drop. It's going to have mm -hmm. an instrumentation package that you can order, which is called our pressure differential arm and automatic timer flush, uh, which are all outdoor rated boxes. Uh, the pressure differential arm is going to monitor that pressure from the, uh, of course, the dirty water side to the clean water side. And as that pressure differential um, builds up to say around a seven, the system is gonna go into a back flush mode, which is then gonna open up a flush port, which is located at the base of the strainer. And under flow and under pressure, it's gonna flush out automatically. Um, and it's, it's only gonna flush for seven seconds, depending on the flow rate and pressures, will depend on how much water you use. But if mm -hmm. you can imagine, say, just running that 750 gallons per minute through a um, six inch strainer and it flushes, it's like a fire hydrant going off. It's going to pull all the contaminants basically in the reservoir and kick them out. Also, it caused so much turbulence on that screen to kick out a lot of the particles off the screen and kick them out of the strainer. So um, gotcha. it's, it's a nice little feature. You don't need to bring in water. You don't need to bring in anything. It's under flow and under pressure. So strainers in general, you either you either monitor the pressure and flush them yourself, you clean them yourself, or you have an automatic system that has a sensor and a flush valve. Is that, are those the two options? Is that correct? That's correct. You can either put okay. gauges on it and monitor yourself. Uh, on applications where, you know, say you're using a very large mesh screen, like a 20 mesh, 30 mesh, where you're trying to get out the big particles, I see a lot of gauges on the units. When mm -hmm. you're getting to the finer uh, filtration levels, the 80 mesh, 100 micron, 130 micron, somewhere around there, 100 micron, um, then we see a lot of instrumentation packages. Um, some of you is guys, that because the gauges just can't pick it up or because they uh, require more cleaning? It, it's going to be more cleaning. Uh, mm -hmm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, it can also, a lot of those particles will, you know, can cling onto the screen where then they have to be flushed out. Um, if you, if any of you are in the extrusion blow molding and injection molding business, um, there's a great filter for those applications to keep those molds cool and clean. Um, we sell a lot of them in those applications. They work extremely well. Typically you're bringing in one line, having drops down from the ceilings at two inch or three inch connections and then filtering the water going into the, you know, the molds. Um, it does a great job. Um, just another example, Tesla, they use uh, welding machines, basically automatic robot machines to, to weld everything on the cars. And those uh, machines basically feed through the nozzles of the welding, the spot welder, um, seven to 11 gallons per minute. And they use a lot of strainers just in front of the welding machines just huh. to keep that path nice and clean. So any areas you need to keep nice and clean, a strainer will do a great job for that application. Thank you. That's good information. We, we do have a few questions, David, if that's okay. Sure. Um, we've been uh, lucky today. We have a very interactive uh viewership and we so appreciate the questions and please drop drop some excuse me who had something in my throat there please drop a question in the chat here if you have any we're glad to we're glad to answer them so paul holloway uh is asking um can this double as a hydronic air separator or is an air separator still needed um great question um we do put an air relief at the top of the uh, the units. I don't know if you can see it right there. Um, uh, it's not even on this drawing here. Uh, I can't really see it there either. But we do put an air relief at the top of our strainers. Um, you know, I, I know you're probably re referring to, I can't think of their name right now. They're yellow and you see them all over the place. Um, but, you know, we don't, they're, they're, 
they're a little different. I don't, I don't think they should call themselves a filter or air separator. They do a great job to eliminate that. Um, but we have some people that have used them in the past, uh, to separate the air out of the, out of the system. Um, and they work extremely well, but, um, most of the time they're just used as a strainer, uh, with a very low pressure drop with the air relief on it as a bonus, um, for it, but they're not sold exactly for just air relief. Okay. Thank you, David. And Renee is asking, uh, would you locate these downstream of the chill water pump? Yes, exactly. Um, on the discharge side of the chilled water pump, I would definitely recommend that's where you need to locate these. And one thing is, is that our designs, um, you can take a look there. You have the recommended flow rates in the surface area. Um, as you can see, our surface area goes up all the way through 10 inch and 12 and 14 kind of stay the same. But uh, we're going to have around, depending what you're comparing it to, anywhere from three to six times more surface area than uh, a lot of screen or bag filters that are out there. Um, so that gives us a really good advantage. And that's how we can keep our low pressure drops. We have a lot of surface area, uh, but they're located in the pump that on the pressure side because you are flush your flow so we like that um, but that's typically where they're located either one one big large strainer and through an 8 inch line 1350 gallons per minute that's roughly 80 per second um but a big eight inch strainer but i've also seen them where hey they don't always put a big eight inch and they might have some drops that are four inch or three inch and put smaller units at those locations um so but definitely on the discharge side of the pump that would be perfect. Great. Thank you, David. I'll let you know if any more questions come in. So. Okay. But I wanted to go back to this screen just to show the surface area and the recommended flow rates on there. Uh, we have charts for all this to give you the curves rate way out there. And for any of your strainers that you specify or looking to install, I would definitely look at all those um, pressure drops that you're, that's occurring. So um, for just strainers in general, make sure to check yeah drop. that's the message there exactly because i can't tell you how many times you know we replace basket strainers or some other strainers where they're always cleaning them or they're always dirty and they get high pressure drop and it's causing issues um and you know it just goes back to you know looking at the surface area the more surface area you have the lower the pressure drop less less often it's going to have to be cleaned that goes for any type of gotcha problems. Uh, we also make our Thompsons at skid packages. We did talk about the, the last question was great about where to locate them off the discharge side of the pump. But if you wanted to do a, um, a package as like a side stream package or anything like that, we do offer pumps with Thompson strainers, all the controls, alarms, et cetera, um, either with our Maxim controller, optional Allen Bradley or Siemens control. But this is uh, in competition with like, we see a lot of centrifugal separators out there. Have we used centrifugal separators? We have, and I have, but mostly in the mining applications where there's a lot of sand and dirt because that's what they were initially designed for. But you do see specs for them in the cooling tower world. And um, we offer this as, as an option if you want to compete with centrifugal separators, but it does have a barrier, does come with a pump. You can take your flush to a solid recovery vessel if you would like, or just take it to drain. Um, but that's a, a feature we do offer. Um, and again, they're everything from, as you can see here, from the two inch models all the way down to the 10 inch models uh, we can make. So you have the different flow rates. We give you a recommended flow range. You can um, go to any of our typical, our websites. We do include pump curves with them. So you can take a look at the pump curve. I always like to look at pump curves, make sure we have enough pressure and flow and make sure if we're feeding anything, we have enough pressure. So if you're taking mm -hmm. it out of a pressurized line, putting it in, or if you're putting it to sweeper piping, it's critical to have enough pressure to make those work properly. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> There's a little video here, which I will, I will play. Let's see if um, that goes through. There you go. Oh, it looks great. Give you a little idea of how it works. So dirty water in the bottom, filter knocks it down. 
collects in the bottom. And that's the flush valve. That would be a manual flush valve there, I'm assuming. There you go. Nice. If you're listening to this uh, at a future date and um, not seeing this video, you can go to Miller Lehman YouTube channel and this, this video is on there. So. Or it's on our website as well. Or it's on. Okay, great. And, and after looking at that, you can see how, you know, the particulate comes in, say a, a four inch line and it mm -hmm. hits the housing, which is much larger. So the velocity slows down. So on all types of filtration, as soon as the velocity throws, slows down through a media filter, a barrier filter, you're going to get better filtration. So we bring right. ours in. It's a unique design. Um, it flushes under flow and under pressure. And so they're made right here in the United States. So as you notice the inlet, and the outlet are 180 degrees apart. If you said, David, I need one, or Tony, you need one on the same side, inlet and outlet, for the ease of installation, we can do that. 90 degrees, 45 degrees, whatever you need for the outlet, it just has to be above the inlet. But uh, it could be in any location since they're made right here. Great, thank you, David. Go through that. Now we step on into the automatic turbo disc. The automatic turbo disc in, in the HVAC market is really becoming um, a standard for side stream filtration because you have what's sold out there is centrifugal separators, sand filters, and then a disc filter. And our disc filter is going to have a much smaller footprint than like a, a sand filter. It's going to use, use you know, less than one tenth the water as a sand filter uses to back flush. Um, so it's also going to weigh a lot less, which is great for, for bigger buildings. Um, it, it's going to get down to anywhere from 10 to 400 microns, um, whatever disc that you choose to be, to be, mm -hmm. to use in that system, it's going to really polish the water up. So it's not only going to remove the non-organics like the sand and the dirt, it's going to remove organics, algae, cottonwood seed, pollen, whatever's in that water. Um, and depending on where the cooling tower is located, uh, with, you know, if there's construction going on, non-construction trees, et cetera. Um, but, um, it's going to definitely be the standard and the only drain it needs is a two inch drain. And that goes for any of our systems depend, not even depending on what size it could be 130 gallon per minute, or it could be 10,000 gallons per minute, like we have in Chicago. And it's still a two inch back flush line. So that's pretty remarkable. Um, and I have a slide here shortly that I'm going to show you more about the, uh, the amount of water is back flushing the unit. So David, unit, a quick, quick, Mm -hmm. Side side note here for the you, we might have a lot of engineers here who are kind of new to the industry and just trying to learn when you say sure. side stream filtration, what is it a side stream of? Are we talking about the condenser water, the chill water mm -hmm. loop or, you know, can you fill in the blanks a little bit? Yeah, on that? yeah most definitely. Um, for the cooling tower, basically. Um, you take the, the tonnage of the cooling tower, and this is all coming from Cooling Tower Institute, is basically say it's a thousand ton cooling tower. You multiply that by three, you get 3,000 gallons per minute. That's what typically that tower is running, is around 3,000 gallons per minute, plus or minus a few. Um, that system right there is a three pod system. As a rule of thumb, 100 gallons per minute per pod. You can go down to 75 gallons. You can go up to 125 gallons per pod, but just a rule of thumb, 100 gallons per minute per pod. So on that one, well, a thousand ton cooling tower flowing 3,000 gallons per minute, typically you would want to take eight to 10% of that and do a side stream. That means you're basically taking it out of the sump or some equalizer piping filtering it and then returning back to the tower, either, either just over the wall of the tower, underneath the tower, or through a sweeper system, which I would recommend. Um, and all of our systems are designed in, in mind with feeding sweeper system. So you're always going to have enough pressure returned mm -hmm. back to the unit to really get it agitated, to keep that water moving and the particulates moving to the suction line of the, of the filtration system. Yeah, thank um, you. And for those who don't know, like the bottom of a cooling tower, the basin is a amazing dirt collector, right? An air washer and dirt collector. And if you try to filter that water, the set what happens is the sediment just pools at the bottom, right? So you may have inches of, of dirt and, and grime at the bottom of that. So the sweeper system basically stirs that up enough 
So that when you pull the water out of there and you just jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, David, but it stirs it up. So the water's, the, the particulates are floating in the water, suspended in the water. They come back and the filter can grab it that way. The, that's correct. And a lot of the sediment that is settled down is almost like a bile digester. It really gets mm. hot. I've been to some cooling towers. You put your hand in them and you feel the the muck at the bottom and it's, it's heating up the water because hmm. it's, 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 it, decompose when you're trying to cool it too yeah exactly and i've seen pans of cooling towers rot out in in months not just years but months because of you know the corrosion that occur when it's starting heating up like that so um that's critical um so and then that's side stream so taking it out of the equalizer piping or the cooling tower filtering putting it back through say a sweeper system there's also a slipstream which is basically taking out of say the pressurized line after the pumps filtering it and then putting it back into the same pressurized line or back into the return line. Um, if you put it back in the return line, you typically have a pressure drop of a difference there that you don't need a flow pump. Um, but if you're wanting to put it back into the same line, then you're still going to need a flow pump, probably a little less head pressure, but coming out of that line, filtering it and putting it right back into the line. And, you know, if there's dead lakes, dead legs around a chilled water line or anything like that, these are also great to pull the water out, filter it, and then put it right back into the pipe. So um, what was that term? Dead legs? Yeah. Like example, uh, Minnesota, they have a lot of chilled water line downtown and they have a lot of dead legs where you're not getting a lot of flow through that line. It's stagnant oh. water. And I heard that before. Pick up dirt. You know, it could start, mm. you know depending what's in the water, you could get uh, biozone, you know, different at rhizone algae, which can grow in darkness and you need to really pull it out, filter it and put it right back in to keep things moving. So we can do slipstream, side stream, what, whatever you need. And we can also do full flow where in some cases like at Goodyear tire and, and uh, whirlpool and stuff like that. I I've seen where they did a hundred percent filtration where they want to filter all the water go into a particular machine, mm. a particular application. And um, the beauty of our filter is, is that say it's a, an eight pod system uh, of filtering, say 700 GPM. Even when we back flush, you're still getting 700 GPM downstream because we're only taking one or two pods off at a time to filter, to, excuse me, to back flush while all the other pods are still filtering, sending it downstream. So in the turbo dish, you don't have an interruption of flow during a uh, back flush. Gotcha. And then these are some of the models, um, you know, granted, uh, we have, I think we have over 500 design now, but these are the most popular and the ones that we focus on, on, on cooling tower, chilled water applications. Um, but you can see the range of filtration level of the flow rates, um, that we can, that we can achieve with these systems. Um, so, uh, you know, wherever you're located or if you have already purchased one, we appreciate that. Um, but the footprints are going to be much smaller than a sand filter. They're going to weigh a lot less than a sand filter. And that's our big, you know, competition. Sand filters are great. They do a great job. They filter extremely well. They're just highly inefficient and they're maintenance hogs because you do have to change out sand. You do have valve issues. You have lateral issues and laterals are basically at the bottom of a sand tank that could break and they will break periodically where then sand gets released to the cooling tower. And I can't tell you how many even strainers we sold after sand filters just to prevent any sand from making it back to the cooling tower. So um, with our disc filters, you don't have to have, have any of those issues. Um, the next slide will give you a little comparison about water savings. So if you have a three pod, 300 GPM, a six pod, 600 GPM, or a 12 pod, 1200 GPM, uh, compared to a back flush water of a single back flush, that's one back flush. You're going to be saving, you know, um, you know, around 860 gallons of water for a three pod. Cause ours is going to take around 36 gallons of water to back flush where a sand filter is going to take around 900 gallons of water back. Mm -hmm. So just in one back flush, say you do two a day, that, that really adds up. Um, and then the question is, is where, <clears throat> where do you get your back flush water from? So our turbo disc is taking the back flush water from our clean water manifold. You can kind of see each system right there has two manifolds, a dirty water manifold and a clean water manifold. Of course, the clean is on the discharge side. 
we're taking the clean water and we're putting it through a small little booster pump, either two or five horsepower. That's going to boost it up and back flush either one or two pods at a time. Where a sand filter, you have to bring in the water, either you're using tower water like we're using. And if you are, you're dumping a lot of chemicals with it, or you're hooking up city water to it and using that source for your back flush. We don't have to have the city water hook up. And since we don't use a lot of water, we can just use the tower water for that. Um, and again, it's only a two inch back flush drain where now if you have a 300 GPM sand filter, you're probably looking at a four inch line, a, a 600 GPM, probably either a four inch or six inch line, a 1200 GPM, either a six inch or eight inch line. And that's a lot of water going to drain. That gives you a comparison of uh, the water used. Right. And we've been kind of running a theme today of, you know, engineering trade-offs, right? So if you're an engineer designing the system, look at all the different options, take into account, you know, the maintenance of it, the cost, the weight, size, and the, uh, in this case, the back flush and, you know, all the different parameters of it. As, as most of our viewers know, I'm, you know, preaching to the choirs, but um, it's been kind of like what we've been talking about all day. What's the best solution? It depends, right? So, exactly. Cool. Um, here's a little video of um, you can just watch it back flush. And, and I know this video, <laughs> David. I know this yeah, one. We took that in the parking lot in Asheville, North Carolina. <laughs> um, one thing I would just want you to watch is you can watch the water spin as it comes into the into the chamber where our disc stack is that basically keeps the heavier particles away from the disc stack so it prolongs your back flush it's not just sitting onto an element like so before you play that mm -hmm. oh sorry david go ahead i didn't mean to interrupt you no go ahead you're fine uh before you play that so what you're looking at there um if you saw the previous slides the pods are they don't ship like that that's just a demo where it's a clear version of the pod and inside there there's little plastic um I don't know. What do you call them? Do you call them filters? They're, they are. They're polypropylene discs, basically. They're um, basically discs, and you're going to see the water is dirty. He's going to run it, and then it's going to be clean. He's, you're basically going to back flush it here. Is that correct? That's correct. You're going to. I just want you to see the water coming in, and then you're going to see it back flush. And a couple of things that we do that I want you to notice is that the water is in the stack. Depending on the velocity, it could be all the way to the top. It could be right around that area. Um, it could be 50% covered, um, depending on the flow rate and the velocity you're running. Um, and then when we go through a back flush, we apply a little air to the top of the pod. That's why you see this little air line that's on the top mm -hmm. of the pod. And that air basically is 25 PSI and it pushes all the water and contaminants that are, that are suspended in the water out of the system. And then the jet spray out tangentially, scouring and cleaning the disc. We also separate the disc. So you'll see a piston cap right at the top right here, kind of separate around a half of an inch, separating the disc so the jets spray out tangentially. But take a look at it, and then I can answer any questions you have afterwards. And hopefully it's playing. There it goes. Yeah, so the water swirling around there represents... It's been it's been working a while collecting dirt, right? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes when we live stream and play these, but I, it's good. We can still get the gist of it. Um, so this would be what we're viewing now is just normal operation. Dirty water's coming in. It's grabbing the stuff out of the water, and you're going to push the button and you're going to clean the back flush it, right? So that's the back flush. Got it. Yeah, it's a good video, David. Thank you. Yes, and, and one thing I want to say is that we typically back flush at around 60 to 80 PSI. That's probably around 40 PSI right there because we have the clear cover on it. Um, and there's a limit to how much pressure we can put on that clear cover. Um, so when we go to applications, we can adjust that back press pressure due to how dirty the application is. If it's just a cooling tower, typically we're around 60 to 70 um, PSI. It works extremely well. If we had a wastewater or a, or a paper pulp mill application, we might be at 90 PSI because the loading is higher. Uh, the particulates, you know, are, are a little bit more challenging to, to, to flush out and we might back flush for a longer duration. That system right there can back flushes for around five seconds. It uses around 
uh, four gallons of water to back flush. And we make a, a, a whole line of air assist systems that use very little water to back flush. Uh, and then in other applications where we're using the booster pump, we might be back flushing for around 12 seconds um, instead mm. of five. So we, it's user friendly and it's adjustable in the controls depending on basically how dirty the water is. Great. Skip through that. Any questions there, Tony, at all or anything? No. Okay. Everything's good. Uh, we're moving on to our Tower Guard sand filters. Uh, we make a variety of these. We make them in fiberglass or stainless steel, uh, whatever you'd like. Um, so they're, they're totally automated, just like the um, auto, uh, other automated sand filters out there. Um, sand filters come in a variety of sizes, but your typical ones are the they call them 20 inch ones. It's the, it's the diameter of the housing, 24 inch, all the way up to 48 inch um, models, anywhere from 44 to 250 gallons per minute. Um, you can get them larger. Uh, other manufacturers make them much larger than we can make them. Um, but we, we want to limit it to that because right there, the largest one's using around five to 750 gallons of water to back flush. Um, that's a lot of water to back flush, uh, you know, so we, we see, you know, the market is, is on the smaller cooling towers. Um, if they would like that, we can provide that, um, sand filters, like I said, does a very good job. It just take that number flow rate number and typically times it by two or three, and that's going to be your back flush rate. Um, and it's a lot of water, so it's not a uh, very green, as you would say, and they would need larger drains or you would need a tank to hold the water in. There's a lot of var variations where it, it just doesn't work. Um, the weight of the units much heavier than similar units that we make in the turbo disc. Um, so it's, you know, it, I would have to say back in the nineties, we sold quite a few of these. Now we sell a lot more disc filters and I, and I see a lot more of, of disc filters out there on the market. Gotcha. So the options for chill water loops, condenser water loops, towers are strainers, sand filters, or a turbo disc type technology. So those are kind of the three. And I, you know, I would say like, I know when I was a rep and an engineer was calling me for tower selection, I would send them a selection for each of those three and then a budget and then the pros and cons, and they could make the decision with the owner based on that. So if you're a designer and you're not sure, you know, just ask if you're, Insight Partners is your rep. Just call us and, and you know, we'll give you those three, you know, those three options so you can evaluate that those different technologies with your with your own client. Exactly. The the good, better, best options there. Yeah. That's, that's mm -hmm. what we do quite a bit and and take a look at the, the benefits and the efficiencies of all of them. Sure. Now we're going to move on into the ultra filtration system. So the All membrane filters, mm -hmm. are we seg segueing into a different, you wouldn't put this on a chill water loop or a, um, a that's a water loop or would you? We have, we have okay. used, um, on, you know, cooling towers, side stream, little systems like that. We've used our ultra filter. We've also used it where they're using cooling tower makeup water. That's now reuse water. So they're getting reuse water to make up on their cooling tower. Uh, instead of just city water or well water, they're getting reclaimed water from the local wastewater treatment plant. And they're wanting to purify that water a little bit more before they put it in their cooling towers. We have used the ultra filtration on many applications like so that. So this is just a very, you know, high efficient um, membrane filter, right? It's like exactly. the HEPA filter of for water. Is that, <laughs> is that what it's like? Yeah, okay. it's, gotcha. it's it gets down to, I mean, it's, it take your coffee and make it into crystal clear water. That's what it'll do. Is so, UF a, yes. a, a term? Is that a, a, a ultra term for filtrate. Miller Lehman or is that okay? No, gotcha. it's a standard term. And when you get into membranes, it's it's pretty standard. Either you sell okay. ultra, nano, or micro membranes, and that falls into this category, or you, and then it goes down to RO reverse osmosis filter, filtration. So, so this so. filter is say those again UF. Ultra US filter, ultra filter, nano filter, and micro filters, and those are all rep. Th those all those represent are all like a extremely a, high efficient yeah, filtration. You're, you're okay. within all a, a very 0 0.01 micron, roughly, give or take. You know, depending on which one. The ultra filter is probably one of the most popular. Um, we also um, sell this 
it's a very low pressure membrane, as you can see, less than 115 PSI flow rate through it. So when you think of membranes, everybody thinks of, well, high pressure because you got to get it clean and stuff. Well, right. we worked with a, a company out of Germany and we purchased their membranes uh, for our skid systems that work on a very low pressure, less than 15 PSI. So it, it makes it very efficient energy wise. I mean, the pump flow pumps on these things are only two, three, five horsepower. That's it. Um, so you don't, you don't need that high pressure pump. We get into the high pressure pumps when we get to the RO series. Um, so they're, they're very efficient. Uh, we've, we've sold quite a few, few of these, like I said, in reclaim water, we sold them to, you know, camps where they're taking well water and they want to purify it more where they, mm -hmm. they're going to use that for their process or, or, or irrigation purposes or showers or just, you know, a variety of different things. Um, we've also sold them as a pre-filter to an RO system where then it makes potable water and that's for drinking water. So there's gotcha. a variety of applications that you can put these in, but it's really for the customer that really wants to get down to a very small micron and, and wants the turbidity, which is discoloring in the water. Um, and one end to you is like water. And I would have to say that coffee's around, you know, 400 into you, you can't see through it. It's black, you know, stuff like that, or even higher. Um, mm. but yeah, it's probably even higher than that. It's probably 4,000 into you. So if it's good coffee. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and so we're bringing it down to that one end to you, which then makes potable water. Uh, and very uh, crystal clear water. Yeah. Um, if you're filtering certain things that have uh, um, dyes in it, you might not get all the dyes out, but typically you can get it down to one end to you. Well, Renee has a question and I had the same question. So she must be very smart. Um, what is the life of the, is this a membrane that gets filled up? You throw it away or do you clean it, backwash it? Or what is the life typically and how does that yeah. work? Um, typical life is around six to eight years. It does back flush itself automatically. Okay. Um, it does back flush as a train. So if you have, you know, multiple units like the skids that we have are around this size, um, you're going to back flush the whole system at once. It's going to be very low pressure. Uh, the back flush pressure is going to be a little bit higher than 15 PSI. Your flow pressure is anywhere from 10 to 15. And then the back flush pressure is going to be anywhere from around 14 to 18. And they're all on VFDs. So that's all being monitored during the back flush. We're going to back flush it all at once. So it's all down at one time. Uh, and then we're also going to probably use uh, an enhanced back flush periodically, probably once every month, which is going to inject probably, I'm just going to give it a little example here, like chlorine, something like that into the mm -hmm. system. It's going to start injecting the chlorine. Um, it back flushes with, uh, typically on the discharge side, you have a tank. That tank is your clean filtered water. That's the water you bring back in to back flush. And then we have an injector that might inject some chlorine. The system's going to shut down probably for around 10 minutes and let that sit in there for a little while. And then boom, it's going to turn back on and then finish the back flush do one more back flush and then back into service a hundred percent. Um, that happens around once every month, depending on the application. I have customers that do it once every six months. I have customers that don't do it. Uh, and in that case, if you don't take care of the membranes, the life duration is going to be a lot less. We have SpaceX and SpaceX uses our membranes they will not back flush because they will not back. They'll back flush, but they won't back flush with any chemicals because they don't want anything in their process, only with the water that they're producing. So in turn, mm -hmm. their life is their life of the membrane is around 18 to 30 months. I think it's been so far. So um, if, they, if you're not doing anything like that, you could have to replace the membranes uh, uh, sooner than later. And they're all cam lock now connections. So to re to replace a membrane, it takes you around five minutes. That's it. If that, um, nice. so you just pop them on, pop them off. Um, but, uh, and we have the membranes in stock, uh, uh, you know, so you can also, we build systems that, you know, other companies have used different membranes in. So you, you can, if, as soon as you get, have a system, you can use our membranes. You might be able to use another company's membranes as well. They're interchangeable in a lot of sense. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, Another question here. Do you need a pre-filter for ultra fine membrane systems right. typically? Okay. Um, pre-filtration, they do come with uh, 
uh, bag filters is pre filters. Um, and that's down to 100 micron. That's what we specify. Um, and that's typically anywhere from 50 to hundred micron is specified in any ultra filtration membrane system. Um, we also use our turbo disc in some applications. Um, we have systems that are in hemp farms and they're using well water and they'll go through the turbo disc then they'll go through an ultra filter. And then they always want to use RO filter water. So we then put it through our, our, RO system. And that's a whole schematic flow chart. You know, it goes into turbidus, yeah, yeah. it goes into a tank, it goes into the UF, it comes out of the UF into a tank. And then, you know, we use that water to back flush the UF and then that water feeds also the RO. So it's a whole schematic that we can provide you as well. But uh, um, it's, it's, it's great technology. Um, they do flush extremely well, but you do have to take care of them. But the, the life is, you know, you know, five to eight years is what we see most often. And right. by putting pre-filtration and by doing enhanced back flushes, it'll, they'll last a long, a long time. Great. Okay. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the RO. Um, so again, for those who are new, RO is reverse osmosis, correct? Correct. Okay. It's, you know, RO is kind of like, do we use it for cooling towers, chilled water? I haven't sold them for any of that stuff. Um, okay. Do they use it at your local car wash? They do. Your final rinse where the water beads on your car, that's RO water. Do they use it for, you know, the hemp industry? Yes, they do. Do they use it, you know, to, you know, just drinking water applications? Yes. Do they use it in making semiconductors and all that? Yes, they do. So there's a lot of opportunity out there for RO. Um, even feeding CAT scan machines and stuff like that. Um, so you just got to look at every application for RO because RO makes very aggressive water. So I've had some customers that, you know, we've told them don't use metal piping on the discharge side of an RO because it is going to drop the pH from around 7 or 7.5 down to 6.5 and it's going to be very aggressive water. And it could, I've seen it where, you know, it destroyed piping afterwards. So, so aggressive you, water is acidic? Yes. Do and I have that right? Okay. That's how I phrase it. Yes. Um, gotcha. One foundry and it used it recently and they destroyed all their, their piping because they put cast iron piping in and they put RO water in it. And oh, wow. Didn't cooperate so very be well. careful of that. If yeah. you're gonna use so, RO. And I know yeah. you and I talked about the hemp, the you know indoor agriculture or right. any indoor ag uh, where they're growing plants, obviously the plants like the water to be a certain way. And this product is used commonly, whether you're feeding it from a well or from city, et cetera. Right. Exactly. And, and the beauty of RO is that you're, you're making purified water. So you know what you're starting out at. In a lot of cases, if someone brings in city water, they'll still put it through an RO, but we'll have to be, we'll have to put some softeners in front of it to remove some of the, um, um, bleach chlorine basically in the water before it right. gets to the RO because it would hurt the RO. And then when it purifies it, it's putting it in some tanks. And if it's an application where they're feeding it in to cool something, or if it's an application where they're feeding plants with it, they want to know exactly they're starting off with pure water. So when they interject fertilizers, fertigation or any of that into the water, they know where they're starting out. If they're using well water, they don't know could have a lot of iron it could have a lot of you just you know, don't right you just don't know where you're starting out at so they don't want to test their water so they know exactly where they're starting out at and uh we have some customers in industrial applications that want to know exactly where they're starting out at with their ro water so then they could feed it in to their process of what's best for them so um but that's gotcha. that's ro and and usually you do ro since it is expensive nowhere near like it used to be. So and same thing with ultra filtration. You'd be surprised where the pricing is now for ultra and RO. Um, but typically you, you measure RO by gallons per day. So how many gallons per day do you need? Uh, and then we have a variety of sizes um, that we can provide. And, you know, sometimes I need 80,000. And then maybe we do two 48 inch, you know, systems, you know, whatever we need to do uh, to achieve those flow rates. So um, it's, it's very effective. Mm -hmm. Great question you asked before about pre-filtration. 
yes, you definitely need pre-filtration in front of RO. Again, we do always put some pre-filters in front, but um, you know, typically we're feeding an RO with an ultra filter, or you could look at spun wounds, which is a manual like bag filter that filters down to very small micron. Um, that's commonly used as well. So, uh, but you definitely need a, a pre-filtration to an RO. Great. Thank you. And I, I have another question here from Jeff Harris. Um, for small day surgery facilities, what are best practices for sterile processing in the Southeast? Hmm. Good, great question. Um, now, I mean, we sell systems to hospitals, but it's not mostly in the sterile department. Uh, we've been asked and we built some systems that were not filters, but they were designed to sterilize uh, utensils like they're using for operations and stuff. Um, but I would have to say that, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure what they're using in, in the rooms to sterilize. I know that if you just go into a restroom, it's just city water at, at a hospital, um, you know, and, and probably where the sinks are, where they're washing their hands are probably city water. But uh, it goes into, um, you know, making uh, sterilizers that, uh, basically, you know, they steam and they clean the utensils under pressure. Um, if that's what you're asking about, if you're asking about the water they're using, uh, for cleaning that, I I'm sure they're probably using city water, but then they're bringing them into this next step within, um, sanitizes everything, or they're sending their equipment out to get sanitized and brought back in. Uh, and that's mostly, I'm thinking of, you know, the things they're using to operate on humans with, um, those all come packaged back in the package ripped open and then used. Um, if that's what you're asking, um, I hopefully answered that correctly. That's a good one. Um, but I'm not sure. I know we built some systems because Miller Lehman used to be in the cryogenic tank business and we built some pressurized systems that they do sanitize hospital, uh, equipment in. Um, and then repackage and send back out. Awesome. Is, you, is, is, could you ask that person that help or, uh, Jeff, let us it? know if, yeah, no problem. Jeff, just let us know if that helped, if that was what you were looking for. And you could, of course, email me. Anybody here can email me afterwards and we'll be glad to yeah. connect you with David and give me <clears throat> answers to your specific questions. And, and thank you so much for the questions. It's a big help to help now, us uh, present. To, to go back to hospitals, I must say that Miller Lehman's um, probably little niche markets in the HVAC are hospitals and universities. Gotcha. Um, they all look at Legionella issues and cooling towers and other things. And I would have to say that, you know, looking at what, you know, our, our customers over the last 20 years, uh, we're well known in the hospital industry for our cooling tower filtration, such as the turbo disc and the universities. Uh, and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's a lot to do with Legionella and removing it. It has to be a good combination of a good filter and a good chemical use. So just like your pool awesome. at home, if you right, have a pool at right. home, you got to use both chemicals and a filter to keep it clean. So the process of using a millennium turbo disc on a cooling tower and using the chemicals, uh, we're well known in the hospital industry and, and we, we've attended many hospital shows and I've even have I've given talks at some hospital shows before in the past. Yeah. So I, I had a pool, I had a pool in Florida for 10 years and at year nine, I just about figured it out how to... <laughs> get the filtration and the chemicals, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jeff, yes, Jeff yes. says, yes, you did answer his question. Um, Joshua Horner has a quick question. Like if for skid systems in general, do they, use, do they, are they usually built with storage tanks for high demand systems or are they usually provide separate? Um, if you're re referring to the membranes, they, they are built with storage tanks. So um, yes. Um, great question. So you're not always providing the exact flow that they need continuously. It's batched out to mm -hmm. whatever they're using the water for. So yes, we, we don't pr typically provide the tanks. It'll be on our schematics probably to them, but I don't ship air so they can buy a tank locally, but yes, for the membrane systems, tankage is necessary for the, right. um, turbo disc systems or strainers technology, any of that technology, typically we don't provide any storage systems. Right. Right. Okay. Any other questions or? 
And then really quick, we have some Helix filters, which are similar to our disc, but they come in um, disc or screen. They're point of use filters. They don't back flush. They manually have to be cleaned. Um, but we have a few of those that are used in you know, certain applications. There's hospitals that use CAT scan machines that are water cooled now. Uh, we've been selling a ton of these on, especially up in Canada and New York and uh, um, Washington State and out in Seattle, oh, Seattle area in Washington. But um, those are quite often used. Um, again, Excellent. surface area and flow rate, low, very low pressure drop. We're also known for customization. Uh, we do a lot. We have contracts, which I didn't even put in the slides, but with the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard, we make a lot of our strainers. These strainers out of copper nickel, either 90, 10 or 70, 30, um, you know, so if you have any custom applications where they need, you know, something made out of a different material, we, we can do that. Uh, questions Excellent. we talked about and then contact information and if you have any other questions. Thank you, David. That was awesome. Thank, Thank you so you. much for Great that questions. overview. I appreciate that. No, we, we appreciate you taking the time today to come on and thank you. Thank you so much. So before um, you go, David, if you can hang out for just a second and uh, thank you all for, for watching today. We're about to wrap this thing up. So we appreciate it. If, before you go, if you wouldn't mind giving us a quick uh, star rating, it literally takes just a few seconds. Click on the link in the chat. I know many of you have already done that. So we greatly, greatly appreciate it, but we'd love to get feedback from as many people as possible. So we see how we're doing. If you've had, uh, if you haven't downloaded the PDH certificate for this class, just go down below and click on the link. If it doesn't automatically download, because some browsers will block that depending on your, your security settings, just email me at tmormino at insightusa.com. And of course, email me if you need support on any uh, water filtration products that you want to get in touch with David, um, get touched through me, or you could email your Insight Partners rep. Um, if you don't know who your rep is, you can, you're on right now watching this on our new website, insightusa.com. You can come there at any time and check and see your contact. You can also go to Miller Lehman's new website, which is uh, MillerLehman, one word, dot com. It's right up there in the upper left corner. And um, 